Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manasero. Old dogs, and welcome to Fun Facts Friday. This is our once a week, only on Friday show, where we have special episodes not featuring guests, where I will share tricks, tips, terminology, and techniques that will help skyrocket you to real estate investing success. Today's topic is my 10 biggest mistakes. Hey, I hope you guys are doing good out there. Uh, Before we get started, I just want to touch base with you as I always do. We are kind of winding down here the end of the year here. And uh, I promised you I'd uh, try to bring in some some good, strong content, stuff that you can use, you can take with you here. So I am uh, hoping that uh, this will be one of those shows. And, uh, you know, every real estate investor makes mistakes. In fact, it's an important part, I think, of the learning process. What's important is what we learn from and do with those mistakes and how they help make us better investors. That's that's the key thing. I, I you know, I'm never going to say, hey, I don't make mistakes because I have made tons of mistakes. And um, the great thing about it is that I've learned from every one of those. And that is what makes us better investors, right? Is learning from those mistakes and doing it that much better the next time around. So um, in this episode, I'm you know going to talk about my top 10. I think there's a lot more than 10, but these are sort of the top ones that I, uh, I really got sort of the, the best lessons from. So let's take a look at this. Uh, my 10 biggest mistakes. Now there's a quote that says, failure is the key to success. Each mistake teaches us something. And that is so true. It's, it's an important lesson learned. And I'd even go one step further and say, mistakes are a gift. Without them, the learning process can take so much longer. But it's always better when possible to learn from the mistakes of others. That's why I always ask my guests to share their mistakes and lessons they've learned to hopefully save you that personal pain point there. And I know some people kind of feel, well, why are you emphasizing mistakes here? But I think they get it if they've been a real estate investor for any period of time, they know that there is true value in sharing the mistakes that we make as well as what we've learned for them. And today's podcast, I, I'm going to share, you know, my own stuff. I'm kind of opening up my, <laughs> my vulnerability here and I will share my own personal real estate investing mistakes over the last six years, uh, maybe seven there, um, which I think will match some of the mistakes of many of my guests, um, that, uh, I've interviewed over the years too. And, uh, but, you know, I think more important, you know, more importantly, how can you prevent the same thing from happening to you? And, and that's one of the reasons why we do this on this show is to help you avoid having to make the same mistakes I made and our guests have made. You know, my guests have shared many different mistakes, all of which have been very helpful to me personally in my real estate investing journey. That's one of the great things about hosting this show is I I learn a lot from the guests that I have on. And that's an area that I really, really value. I've avoided a lot of potential problems because of my guests that have shared their mistakes. To be sure, there's a lot that can go wrong when you invest in real estate. I mean, you can overpay for a property, you can uh, buy in the wrong area, use the wrong lender or loan product or overestimate cash flow. There's the list goes on and on. Uh, The list of mistakes is far too long, in fact, to discuss during this podcast alone. But that's why I, I wanted to narrow it down to 10 that I think would be something that you would be able to relate to. So let's go ahead and dig in here. Number one thinking too small. Now, 
when I look back when I started, I was very, very cautious. In fact, it was like trying to pull teeth to get me to spend any money on real estate at all because I, I was, you know, fearful. And I thought, oh, man, I can't afford to lose this. This is, you know, the all I've got, you know, just I was really concerned. And uh, I uh, started by spending 150000 actually a little bit more than that, probably fifty to sixty per property, but about around, you know, one fifty plus of a cash purchase of two Class C single family homes and one Class C duplex um, in Atlanta and in Memphis. The idea here was that uh, I would be able to generate good cash flow. That was always my goal. Then, after a year or two, I managed to borrow against these three properties. Now, keep in mind, I paid cash for them, so they had nothing but equity in them. I borrowed against those three properties um, to get a $100,000 down payment on a 22-unit apartment. And uh, in that, I also took out an additional 50 k for rehab and upgrading. Um, on this 22-unit apartment as part of a value-add deal. Now, what I'm saying here is why um, did I think too small? Well, I actually could have just went ahead and used that 150 to just skip buying those other properties and have gone right to buying the multifamily. Now, I found a multifamily property, a 22-unit apartment in Indianapolis for $350,000. Now, it wasn't listed like that initially. It was listed at four, but um, we were able to negotiate the price down. And um, it, one, I, I, it, it generated a lot more cash flow than those three properties did for me. Um, and, you know, it, but if I would have just gone straight to those, not only would I have got better cash flow, but there was some amazing equity that took place as I upgraded that apartment and implemented a value add strategy. So instead of waiting the, the two or three years that I had to after buying those other properties, if I would have went right there, I could have not only generated better cash flow, but I could have leveraged that property after two to three years because it had gone up in value because of the value add strategy and I could have bought a much larger apartment. Now, then I would have been able to establish a, a strong track record earlier. I could have been real successful as a commercial multifamily operator earlier in the game than I was by waiting and being a little overly cautious. So I'm not saying it's it's bad to be that if, if you're if you want to be a conservative investor, you know, I would say limit your risks. And and that's what I generally do. But I'm just saying in the beginning, it was such a good time of, um, you know, there's so much growth going on in the, in the, in the multifamily marketplace, especially that I, I really could have jumped into the game a lot faster. Number two, investing in cheap properties. Now, when I started investing, again, those first three I mentioned, um, they were all Class C properties. Having invested heavily in Class C properties early on, I had some pretty strong opinions, but I also want, you know, to now look at this in light of, you know, current economic times and how the economy may affect these properties or those properties. There are some real estate investors who seek out Class C properties because of the amazing potential in renovating and upgrading them. They allow real estate investors opportunities to enjoy a significant return on investment by making small improvements on the properties. With proper upgrades, they can realize larger returns. Now, Class C properties do have a higher cap rate than your B's and your A's. Um, but even a Class C, uh, you know, property, um, yeah, there are opportunities there. But the reason why the why it is a higher return is that it's also a higher risk. And uh, that's where, you know, that's where you have to really take that caution. So even though I paid very little money for three properties. I mean, you know, fifty to sixty thousand on an average per property, including one duplex. Um, I had a lot of issues with 
tenants, the quality of tenants that that, that type of property attracts, um, with uh, just things that had to be upgraded because as a Class C property, it's an older property. So you're paying more for repairs and maintenance. And that's something I didn't anticipate. Um, I think I could have saved a lot of money if I would have gone just to a Class B, for example, and I was able to uh, grow that property or leverage that property into another. But instead, I was dealing with a lot of tenant issues. I was doing Section 8 and having to battle with, you know, some of the, the not only the, 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 you know, some of the tenants that were kind of taking advantage of that, but I was dealing with uh, just the, the local um, I think it's city or county force that was um, inspecting those properties and just you know just asking for ridiculous upgrades constantly in, at each inspection. So there were some issues there, but I would say if you can avoid Class C properties, do it. Uh, number three, overestimating cash flow. Now, if you buy a rental property, for example, that brings in two thousand in monthly rent and your monthly mortgage payment, including taxes and insurance and so forth, is let's say fifteen hundred. You may think you you know you you have a five hundred dollar monthly cash flow, but then there's all those other little expenses in there that aren't factored into that mortgage payment, and uh, you know there are repairs, there are you know, administrative costs or are these other things and you begin to realize that with each analysis that you do of a property you remember oh wow this is something I, I forgot to factor in previously and uh, so that cash flow gets reduced more and more and more and you realize gee here's something I thought I would make you know at least 400 in and I'm lucky to squeak out 150 so you really have to know your numbers it's really key and uh, cash flow is something that especially as a retired person you really want to be um, strong and you want to be able to depend upon it so um, there are a lot a lot of factors there uh, again that was uh, one of my biggest mistakes is, is just overestimating what I thought my, my cash flow would be and number four uh, again, you know, I mentioned this here, avoid Class C properties. One of my personal mistakes is that I, I did buy a bunch of Class Cs. And because of that, um, you know, it, the attraction was they were cheap. And Class C properties are usually older buildings that have more than 30 years um, uh, with minimum amenities and their outdated systems and uh, mechanicals you have problems with and so forth. So, um, you know, that's that's a, another one is that I, I, I should have went in there with the idea of avoiding um, Class C properties. I know I sound like I repeated that, but that was talking about just cheap properties in general sometimes we're attracted to cheap properties because gosh you know I could get five of these um, and maybe only get two class B's for the same price but you know those class B's are probably in the long term going to be more valuable to you in terms of cash flow and appreciation than that class C. Uh, number five not venting property managers more carefully. Now when I first bought my my first properties I was um, buying turnkey and so it was a package deal and I thought wow not only do they rehab the property you know but they have this built-in property manager and I thought well that's great because I'm buying it from these people they're going to be accountable um, as a property management firm too um, but that was not the case. Um, a lot of times, you know, you'll have a, a, a turnkey, and I don't say a lot of times, but enough times, you'll have a turnkey provider that will um, will take that property management and, and job it off to somebody else. In other words, these are not their employees. This is just a property manager, maybe in the area that works with them, but they're not really responsible. And so I had, I went through so many property managers with those turnkeys that it was very, very frustrating for me. I didn't know a lot about vetting property managers. In fact, I didn't know anything about property managers, period. And as a result of that, I, I made some poor decisions and I had vacancies that went too long. I had turnovers that took too long. There were just a lot of situations that, um, were just were just really really difficult to deal with. So um, again, learn how to vet property managers and and 
there's a whole set. We have a whole, I mean, a lot of podcasts and blog articles about the questions that you should be asking those property managers before you hire them. So uh, that's a, you know, that's a key one. Number six, not checking out the market better. Now, in the beginning, I was kind of naive. I thought I thought I knew everything, right? You go in there, what are, you know, there are just certain things that you have to look at in a market, especially if you're an out-of-state investor like I was. You have to look at things like, you know, what what are the real estate prices doing in that area? Are they going up? Are they declining? Are they stagnant? Um, you know, what are projections um, for, uh, the, you know, the prices? Are they staying stable? Because a lot of times prices and rents, you know, kind of react the same if it's stagnant you know you're going to have rents that aren't going up you're going to have prices that aren't going up too um, things like what is the local job situation uh, job growth percentages are they going up or down uh, are new employees coming to the area is the market dependent on a single employer like a, a large university or something uh, or an industry you should be compiling those uh, unemployment stats and trends and get a good feel for what's happening with the with the uh, employment situation and then just look at the overall local economy are our businesses closing or moving out of the area are commercial real estate values and office occupancy rates increasing um, is there a redevelopment plan, you know, by the city or uh, by the county that's going on in there? Does the city have a major growth initiative? You know, things like this that are really critical to investors in um, the value of your property. Number seven, wasting time with the wrong funding source. Uh, again, in the beginning, I was very naive. Uh, you know, I just went with the local bank that was referred to me, maybe by the broker um, or by my property manager. And um, I would waste all this time going through just tons of um, due diligence for their side that where they're, where they're vetting me. And, um, and then after, after going through all this, okay, I've already got this property under contract. I'd find out I didn't get the loan. And then I had to go to somebody else. And then, you know, it was, I was afraid it was going to take the same amount of time. So I actually would go to somebody that was a, almost like a private money source. It cost a lot more just so that I didn't lose the deal. But it's so critical to when you go into a deal is to know what you have available to you. Not only the funds you're going to put into a down payment um, and you're going to use for rehab, but, uh, you know, do you have a, a, a dependable funding source? You know, is it a bank or, or a credit union or something that should have been set up in advance for me? That's what I should have had going into these deals. It also gives you leverage, too, in negotiating, too, when you've got that pre-approval or at least a very heavy um, um, sort of support there financially. Uh, number eight, um, not having sufficient operational reserves. Now, this is one, I, I, again, I didn't suspect that I would need. You should have at least a six-month reserve there to back yourself up uh, pending anything that could be happening, not only in the economy as a, a you know, a, on a sort of a macro basis, but on the micro level um, as well. Um, and especially if you're investing in, in C properties, there are things that can happen you know, that you didn't suspect. And uh, you, uh, you know, you may not have caught in that inspection or in your preliminary due diligence and so you've you've got to have that sort of that extra funds in there to be able to not only you know cover your operational like like i said with the i, I didn't think i'd have a problem with the uh, the you know property management and as a result i i had all these uh, months of vacancies that i had to deal with and i you know to back that i had to keep paying the mortgage so i had to tap into other funds in order to, to cover the mortgage in those cases so really important that you have those reserves and a healthy reserve to back you up uh, on any investment that you would do number nine don't just buy for cash flow now I know I sound like I'm talking against myself here because our motto here is cash flow is king, right? It should be, at least for me as a retiree, uh, I think it, it should be a key factor. You know, you want to be able to know that you've got a steady income that's going to be coming in. As I started to invest more, I began to see the advantage of equity too, especially 
during the years that I was investing heavily, um, it was still kind of post recession and their properties were going up in value. So about halfway through my investing efforts, I sought to build in that equity factor more buying properties that had built in equity. So when I signed those escrow papers, I knew I already had equity built into that property and I knew I could leverage that. Uh, in addition, I, I learned about and sought out emerging markets more. And these are areas that were already poised to go up or, or were already going up in value that uh, just added that much more. You know, when I came to the end of my six year goal, it was really, you know, the cash flow was great. And I, and I was thankful for the cash flow. It was the equity that really gave me what I needed to be able to retire with confidence. Even though I had the, the cash flow there, um, the equity is really what I was able to sort of cash in on and then move into more passive investments. So, um, I, you know, yeah, I, when I say don't buy just for cash flow, um, yeah, I, I, I still stand by that. If you can if you can build in an equity play, if you can find off market properties and you can buy under market properties, do it. It's it. It's just going to build that much more. It's, it's like an insurance policy on that property. And number 10, the final one here, not having a mentor. Okay, big mistake. Um, I had done my research, read the books, listened to the podcast, watched YouTube, attended boot camps, and I just felt I, I knew what I needed to know. And I just wanted to jump in. I was anxious and maybe a little bit too anxious. And I kind of felt I didn't need a mentor that I, I had it all figured out. But, you know, in reality, I didn't. And uh, looking back, I see most of my mistakes could have been avoided if I had first sought out a good mentor to bounce things off of before I purchased a property. And, uh, you know, I... I, I even like with the, when I was talking about the turnkey properties, if I would have had a mentor that I could have bounced that off of. And, uh, you know, I was just, a, you know, th these properties look like they were fine to me. I didn't, I didn't even think of going into uh, inspections and so forth because it was a turnkey property. Everything should work. You know, it's guaranteed, right? No, it's not guaranteed. <laughs> no, that's not right. So that was that was a really key thing. Later on, I did get mentors and I was so glad I did because they really opened me up to things that just just kind of put me into, you know, super mode um, where I was moving ahead faster than I, I, I would have dreamed of uh, being able to do it by myself. So um, if you can get that mentor, it's got to be a priority. Do it before you start your investing. If you already have started, it's never too late to find a good mentor and to work with that mentor. Um, it just, it, it just makes a world of difference. And and those, those are my 10. Um, I actually have a couple of bonus mistakes, <laughs> as if we need bonus mistakes here. But anyway, uh, the, I'd say this is and this is when I, 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 I love talking to the old guys. You know, the older they are, the better, you know, I, I just glean from them some such great information. And uh, uh, one of my favorite interviews with uh, with with a, uh, a guy named Samuel Freshman, he was a, um, you know, went to Stanford Law. He was, uh, he wrote literally the book on real estate syndication. Um, a guy that's in, uh, in Los Angeles, he's been in real estate for well, gosh, when I interviewed him 60 plus years, he's probably getting up there, you know, closer to 70 years now. I mean, he, I mean, he's, he, you know, I don't think it was that long, but he's definitely been in real estate for a long time. And I remember asking him the question, like I ask all of my guests, you know, what is, you know, what mistake did you make? What's sort of your biggest mistake? And he had one word, one word answer. Yeah. Selling. Okay, <laughs> go selling. Well, how are you going to make any money if you're not selling, you know? And I, I was kind of surprised um, that that's what he said. But he's, you know, he basically told me the story. He goes, yeah, I, I thought I was a hot shot. I was in L.A., uh, downtown. I'm selling commercial buildings. I got, I bought this office building for a million dollars and I sold it three months later for 
two million. And I was bragging to all my buddies and everything. Yeah, you know, I, I made a million dollars. And yeah, you know, back then when you bought it, I mean, that, that was a heck of a lot of money. But then he says, yeah, but today I see that building every day when I drive into work. And I reminded that this building is not worth $2 million. No, today it's worth $100 million. <laughs> and he's going, why didn't I hold on to it? Anyway, he's a funny guy, but he's a great guy. Um, but, you know, I, I get it. And, uh, you know, sometimes we, uh, uh, you know, and I, I guess the other part of his answer, too, is he said not buying more, too. He said, I should have bought more real estate because you can't lose by buying more. <laughs> you just can't, especially when you, you know, you're buying for the long term. And so um, I'll have a link to that, that show that he's on, but it's a real, a real good lesson learned. But uh, anyway, these are my big 10. And I'm sure if you don't already have some of your own, you certainly will. <laughs> if you're going to be in this for the long term for the long shot. Um, it's not a bad thing. Okay. Don't consider mistakes, you know, something that is, is, a, yeah. I mean, you can say just by the definition of mistake is something you don't want to do, but, uh, I, I consider it more of a blessing than a curse. Um, and, and for me, it was like a free education, if you will. Yeah, it's a hard education. It's uh, from the school of hard knocks, without a doubt. But either way, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try to avoid mistakes as best you can. I mean, you're going to have the mistakes anyway. But understand, mistakes will will happen, and they and and make the best of them when they do happen. Learn from them and chalk it up to experience. The bottom line. If you can learn from other people's mistakes, from this show today, from all of the shows that we've had guests on that have shared their mistakes, remember and learn from what they say about their mistakes. And then from there, you know, hopefully you won't slip up and do the same. You'll find your own way. <laughs> You'll find your own mistakes. But consider it homework. Learn what needs to change. Re-engineer. Do it better and reap the rewards. Well, that's it for now. Please note, old dog listeners, everything presented here today, and there will be some links in here as well, can be accessed in our detailed show notes on the Old Dogs website at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog. And you're going to look for the episode entitled My 10 Biggest Mistakes. 10 out of a million. Anyway, uh, well, that's the show for today. Remember, Cash flow is king and real estate investing the means. Until next time, keep moving forward and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.